uh, control facility at Edwards Air Force Base. What is their function now that the uh, Challenger will be landing at Edwards, Woody? Well, as soon as the Challenger lands, then uh, NASA control of the orbiter goes back to Kennedy, Kennedy Space Center. And since it's not landing at Kennedy, they have had to split their team up and they keep people on standby out there. So they'll have to... 156,000. 156,000 feet is where the Challenger is now over the uh, Pacific Ocean on its uh, approach to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, so to finish up then, uh, they'll have to take care of the convoy operations, the safing of the vehicle, putting it back on top of the 747, and it's probably be about uh, three or four days worth of work that they'll be directing from that uh, particular control center we see there. The voice you'll be hearing in, in the background on occasion will be Mission Control <laughs> keeping us updated as to the progress of Challenger as it makes its uh, approach to Edwards Air Force. The past 7.5, altitude 149,000. In the past, it's taken Challenger by... Houston, take tack hands. Roger, take TACAN. Take TACAN refers to a navigational uh, facility on board. That's right? true. They verify that the TACAN, the information that the tactical air navigation systems, the ground-based systems, are, are having good information for them, so they'll take TACANs into their navigation base or nav base to give them better information on where they are. We should report that the weather is perfect at Edwards Air Force Base, and they'll be landing there at uh, just after sunrise in the west coast, 16 minutes after sunrise in the west coast at 8.30. miles. Eight. Mach 6.6, 6, altitude 138,000. Down to 138,000 feet now. Yeah, and your question on the turnaround, uh, right. it, it takes about a week. Uh, it'll depend this time. You see, the, we just had the turnover of contractors at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Now they're going to have to split their workforce between two functioning orbiters, so it's... Uh, see how well they can do that one. This is the seventh day of a mission that was scheduled for six days because uh, the crew aboard Challenger ran into some problems trying to uh, dock with a manned maneuvering unit, the Jet Howard backpack worn by George Nelson. Unsuccessful uh, at that attempt, they of course were successful. And now that was in, within a minute we dropped from 138,000 to 23, 123,000. This thing's like a rock up there. It's it's not a good uh, glider. Well, the flying brick factory has been referred to as. But it does fly. Uh, the runway they land at, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base, it, we understand it does have lights on it, but is, is, it's in the desert. Is it actually part of the, uh, the desert bed out there? It's a dry lake bed. Dry uh, lake bed. When, it is, when it is really dry, sometimes it gets wet. But when it's dry, it's as hard as concrete. And uh, they just have uh, runway stripes and runway markings painted on the, uh, the surface of this dry lake bed, and it, uh, it serves as a great facility. They've got about uh, 17 miles, I believe, the long direction that they have for between approach runway and overrun. Do commanders like Robert Crippen preference if, if they did have a preference to land at Edwards versus uh, the Kennedy Space Center? Well, Cripp wanted to land at Kennedy this time, I believe. miles, Mach 4, 104,000 feet. Just, just because, go ahead, Woody. Just because they gave him such a hard time last time about missing it due to the weather. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about Edwards is it gives you a lot of margin for error. Uh, we've had brake problems. We've had a number of things that we're still developing and trying to perfect. And Edwards just gives us a lot of chance to have problems and still not have any major catastrophes. Edwards now has a, I mean, rather, Kennedy has a fairly narrow runway, and we're 15,000 feet long. And if that's not enough, you've got a problem. Brake problems, as I recall, we've had brake problems on uh, the shuttle the last two missions. Uh, what is the problem with the brakes? Well, we've had problems uh, on almost every mission, really. Uh, the problem is that uh, they're just not quite <laughs> what we need yet. You're, you're coming in with an extremely heavy vehicle. 75 miles, Mach 3. Down to 75 miles. Feet. Houston, take air data. I to take air data. The air data probes are deployed now, and uh, we're taking air data just like a regular pitot tube on airplane to do landings at uh, Kennedy a lot more comfortably. It's going to be a couple of hours really, before uh, the astronauts have their news conference. What, uh, what is the process that goes on within the confines of the shuttle once they make their landing? Well, as soon as they get touched down, uh, Bob Crippen has to reconfigure the computers to, to handle ground operations. We have to safe a number of systems on board if we happen to have any jet firings while people are walking around outside. Somebody could get very badly hurt. There's a number of systems on board that really have to be taken down. The uh, hydraulic systems all, all set Here's for ground picture. operations. Oh, great. That's Challenger. Center of your screen on its final approach now to uh, 
Edwards Air Force Base. We understand they'll do a left-hand orbit over the uh, runway and then come in on final approach. Houston, approach. transfer state vector to backup. Your convenience. Yeah, that, that's basically true. They'll do about three quarters Altitude of a complete circle. 75,000 feet. 75,000 feet now. And I would guess uh, less than 50 miles from uh, Edwards Air Force Base. I'm sure they are. Interesting highlights you get on it with the uh, the first sunrise coming over the... Ought to be a beautiful landing. So this flight, of course, marks a number of firsts for America's uh, shuttle flights. It's the first time that... Dryden's uh, long-range tracker now has uh, a visual on the uh, Challenger. 3004. First time that... 66,000 feet. Go ahead. An astronaut has gone up for the third time, Robert Crippen, in the uh, shuttle flight. They went higher than any other shuttle flight, 310-mile orbit at one point. And, of course, they were the first crew to successfully retrieve, bring aboard the space shuttle, and uh, repair. Airspeed 1237 miles per hour. Satellite. Uh, tell us about the contrail we're seeing off the uh, rear of that air of the shuttle now. Well, we we need to uh, keep firing our yaw jets for you know, yaw control Altitude, 50, right down to Mach 1. So uh, we're seeing just the uh, the RCS pulsing, if you will. And when that hits that cold air, it produces uh, the same kind of contrail you get from a, a jet airliner. Basically, that's true. It does look like there's a little bit of uh, high thin clouds that are coming through. Well, the way they turn that camera Air's makes it look like it's a tight turn. Twenty <laughs> miles per hour. A touchdown speed, uh, I understand, will be somewhere close to 286 miles per hour. That is really moving. It is, and uh, you're talking a 195,000 pound vehicle. 46,000 feet. Almost 100 tons. <laughs> just a, just a, a breath under. Now we know why they have brake problems. Well, it's also they're on such a very small truck or main gear assembly, too. We apparently, the the camera. Uh, Here it is. Was that the sonic boom, do you suppose, that we just heard? Well, you get a double boom when That's they come That's what it was. We heard a bang, bang. Yeah? It's hard to tell because of the angle of the camera on the ground, but it appears as if they're in a rather steep bank <coughs> on that left-hand turn uh, coming around to final approach at uh, Edwards. Uh, that is a function of the camera. 800 knots, 35,000 feet. We, we don't go over about 45 or 50 degrees of bank. Now they're starting to leave a contrail going through 30,000 feet. Now I suppose, I think that's uh, just compression of the air. Yeah. Right. Also notice we're not using chase aircraft on this particular one. As an old Air Force pilot, it seems to me that's steep glide path I'm fine. Oh, it really is. Uh, we're, we're coming down at about a 23 degree angle. They'll shallow it out to 19 degrees later on. And 690 knots. Flare. 26,000 feet. Now, Commander Robert Crippen is at the controls, is that right? He manually is flying this uh, shuttle down, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uh, he, he will have taken control of that uh, since before they started the turn. Uh, we are not doing automatic landings as yet. Uh, it does some... have the capability, though. Is that correct? Well, it's an unproven capability. Uh... We'll, we'll be having a manual, uh, an automatic landing. 600 knots. Sometime in this. 20,000. Sometime oh, this year. Chase is aboard. Oh, oh, Chase. We have Chase, huh? Is that PJ Weiss in the Chase plane? Yes. It's not really Chase, per se, this time. He's out there with a the shuttle training aircraft. After 100. Uh, Eight orbits? Was that where we ended up? Yeah, I think it did end up. Eight orbits. Space Shuttle <coughs> Challenger. Six, 600 knots, 14,000 feet. Final approach to Edwards Air Force Base in California. Challenger Houston looking good on final. Winds are calm. I can see he's got his spree breakout now, which is on the tail section. They've got both sides open. Now, he won't put the landing gear down until the very end, which is always kind of frightening. 
<laughs> to watch that, air, that uh, aircraft coming in, that shuttle, uh, with no landing gear. 6,600 feet. That's true, and it's going to land whether you've got those gear down or not. Now, we do it now as a function of airspeed or altitude. Just at sunrise. There goes the landing gear. Now those gear have two seconds to come down on their own or else they're pyrotechnically exploded down too, blown down. Crossing the end of the runway. That's what we used to call a grease job. Oh yeah, Crips good. <laughs> Beautiful landing. <laughs> so Space Shuttle Challenger has returned to Edwards Air Force Base precisely on time, 8.38 Eastern Time. Welcome home, guys. Good view of the speed brakes open now. The speed brakes being the uh, two vertical panels on the top of the, uh, the rudder or vertical uh, empennage in the You're Correct, and now we can still get uh, rudder control from those by both, both of them moving to the, the side as they need to. Now, this is just dust and uh, sand coming up off the uh, runway. This is not uh, any smoke or problem. Oh, no, that, that's, that's with dust. With the brakes. What's the sequence of events now that the uh, shuttle has come to a stop on the runway at Edwards, Woody? Well, while the crew is working inside, safing the systems and putting the engines down to the, the drain position, uh, the convoy will move up, and I think they've probably got what we call a mini convoy, which is a small convoy. Uh, they'll have to connect some purging on this because we have... Houston, uh, Challenger is will stop. Roger, welcome back on uh, Friday the 41, Charlie. <laughs> Friday the 41, Charlie. And Friday the 13th. <clears throat> uh, it'll take about a half hour. Challenger Houston, uh, Crip, uh, I'm sure you remember the news, bad news that Brian O'Connor gave you a while back on Flight 7. What was that? The, was that the beer reference? That was the beer Tell reference. Tell us about that. Well, Brian O'Connor told them when he was supposed to land. He was supposed to be landing at uh, Kennedy Space Center last time. And this is a crip. We've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is we've got a case of ice cold beer waiting for you at Kennedy. The bad news is you're going to have to land at Edwards. <laughs> And that same message apparently has been passed on because uh, Crippen yesterday said, see you at the beer party. <laughs> Houston, I have some post-landing deltas for scope on the Ohms RCS. Roger, go ahead. Now, the families of Roger, the astronauts like aboard the left RCS were all uh, Isol, at the Kennedy Space five, Center Bravo, awaiting their return. What will happen? Will they be flown out to Edwards now? I really don't know for sure. Uh, precedent says they may be. Uh, they didn't really have a whole bunch of notice. Two of them open. And the left dome's cross feed. This would appear, appear to be a camera from one of the uh, convoy vehicles out on its way out to uh, to the space shuttle Challenger. Roger and delete hydraulic load test. I'd certainly agree with that. Looks like he's right on the center line again. On the STS-7 landing, he was just a tiniest bit off the center line when he touched down. And of course, he steered it in the... Uh, He's very uh, fond of saying it doesn't matter where you touch game, down, if where you stop, they take all the pictures. <laughs> and he wasn't off much at all. It's just a beautiful landing. And Challenger Houston uh, on 016. We'd like the they old any kind of valve off. Out. Yes, they will. All board the uh, Challenger or no, after not on, they get off? Not on board the Challenger. Right now, those guys are still sitting down working. Uh, very shortly, they'll be unstrapping themselves and trying to get their sea legs back again. Uh, they're, they're still a little bit wobbly, but by the time they exit, they'll have been used to gravity again. Uh, I think it, uh, Dick Truly had said, well, what's it feel like after you land? He said, well, you feel perfectly normal for a 300-pound man. Uh, you really, the, the weight of gravity almost feels oppressive to you. Any idea how the astronauts fared during the mission as far as motion sickness, which is always a problem? I don't know the mission in, in terms of motion sickness. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue our coverage of the, the landing of Challenger at Edwards Air Force Base, but right now let's go back and take a look. at It, it was a perfect landing. Uh, no, no, it didn't appear that they had any brake problems. Of course, they probably won't know that until they do some post-flight inspections. That, that's true. Uh, he may not have even used brakes on this when he had something like 20 miles of runway that he could use, and there was, he could coast to a stop on that if he wanted to. Now, the sequence of events here, uh, they're awaiting uh, 
the arrival of a convoy of vehicles, uh, what happens next, Woody? Well, they'll attach the convoy, the purge and cooling units, as required. Uh, they'll run uh, a team of people around the outside to make sure that the air is safe to breathe. We let anybody go out there without uh, special breathing apparatus. Uh, take about a half an hour. Meanwhile, the crew is uh, safing the systems inside the vehicle, and the outside folks are getting ready to, uh, to tow away. So no one approaches the shuttle until they turn the correct switches to the correct position so that they're not endangering any of the ground crew. Or ground that's, that's this true. appears to be the first uh, contingent approaching the uh, spacecraft now from the left. Yes, they'll be, uh, they'll be going in uh, wearing scape suits, if you will, which is basically a little self-contained uh, uh, atmospheric protection ensemble. And uh, they'll have little testers, and they'll just make sure that the air is safe to breathe. The uh, fuel we use on, on the RCS reaction control system is uh, very noxious. It'll, uh, it'll kill you either separately or in combination with the oxidizer. That really gives you an idea of how large that space shuttle is with the uh, team out there next to it. Oh, it's huge. Fit one and a half Greyhound buses in the payload bay. <laughs> And speaking of fitting things in the payload bay, uh, this crew, of course, did demonstrate that uh, they were able to go into space carrying a 210,000 pound uh, passive experiment called LDEF, or Long Duration Exposure Facility, put that into orbit, and then uh, proceeded to rendezvous uh, later on after an unsuccessful manned maneuvering unit uh, attempt to dock with the satellite failed. Did uh, get that Solar Max satellite aboard, fixed it at the rear portion of the cargo bay, and put it back into orbit and the ground controllers uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland report that initial checks at, at any rate show that it's functioning normally. Now, what are they doing uh, walking around the uh, again, they're nose just, gear and the... Well, they've got air testers, uh -huh. and uh, the folks out by the nose gear are literally testing the forward RCS or the forward Ohm's pod area, the or, uh, forward uh, RCS pod, rather, to, to just make sure that we're not putting out any vapors that could kill people. This whole procedure will take uh, about a half hour, and then the crew will uh, Oh, this, this portion of it will probably <coughs> take another five or 10 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, assuming there are no problems. When and might we see the crew uh, exit the space? That's usually uh, right, a, right at about uh, 30 minutes after the landing. Uh, we've got to get up, uh, I see some fumes coming off, probably the APUs, auxiliary power units up by the tail. Uh, that's about a half hour before they get the hatch open. Again, the Space Shuttle Challenger has landed at Edwards Air Force Base in California rather than the uh, planned landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida because some clouds and rain moved in over Florida this morning. Uh, it was a rather a last-minute decision. As late as uh, uh, two hours before touchdown, they were still uh, go for Kennedy. Uh, for Kennedy. <coughs> oh, yeah, I think the... Uh do not burn for Kennedy this uh, this time came about 15 minutes before he would have uh, done the deorbit burn for Kennedy. So it was. Uh, but from there on, it was a perfectly normal uh, re-entry and uh, approach and landing at Edwards Air Force Base. There's Crip wave. <laughs> we can in indeed a, uh, see him up there. That's now. a good. Uh, those two pock marks you see just forward of the cockpit area are the star trackers, and here you can see the. Uh, the man is just coming close to the RCS areas now. You can see the, the size of those those uh, And that long, uh, uh, what appears to be a vertical rod, that, that's measuring the uh, atmosphere around the spacecraft? That's true. It's, it's pulling in samples, and they'll, they'll pass it over uh, some sensors to see just what they are putting out in terms of uh, vapors. Can you tell by looking at the surface, Woody, whether there's any damage or uh, on re-entry, any, any scorched tiles or any of that, that sort of thing? Not really. I can't see from here. Uh, they had a, a fairly benign entry, I believe, this time in terms of heating. Uh, landing on the lake bed is a little bit rough on us because you throw up the, the dust and the grit, and uh, that it kind of scours the tiles to some extent, but it, it, it's not usually massive damage at all. Now see, the, the engines are now tilting down. They were tilted up before to protect them from the heat of re-entry, and now they're being tilted down. Basically, it's a range range position. <clears throat> Basically, that's a range range position, so if uh, they do get any water in it, it will drain out as opposed to going back in and uh, hurting some of the components. 
Now, this uh, shuttle vehicle will remain, the Challenger will remain at Edwards Air Force Base for how long before it returns to uh, Kennedy? I really can't say. It depends on... Okay, they're finished with that, so they're going to shut down their hydraulic system. It'll be anywhere from four days to a week or so. I'm not sure what the schedule on that was. And then it'll be put atop a modified uh, jumbo jet, 747. 747, with a special tail section on it and special structures on it. In fact, there, uh, there had been working on some, uh, some ways to make that 747 be capable of uh, in-flight refueling, because uh, this, this super weight and super drag, as you can imagine, uh, really keeps the legs of that 747 down to the, the length of it's allowed to fly. And if we do have to have an overseas abort someday, we'll have to be able to in-flight refuel to get the orbiter home. Now, the fact that uh, Challenger landed at Edwards, will that in any way disrupt the schedule for the next shuttle flight uh, scheduled to go in June? Yes and no. This is not the uh, orbiter that will be going in June, but the workforce at Kennedy Space Center now has to split up and send a team out here to work and prepare this, this shuttle. Now that would be the truck on the right would be the uh, vehicle that's going to go eventually pull up in, uh, <clears throat> to the cabin where the uh, astronauts will disembark, I suspect. Correct. That's our modified white room for modified right Edward, white room. Edward, Edward's operations. Challenger Houston, go ahead. Uh, APU uh, hydraulic shutdown is complete. We'll see what's going to go up positioning. Roger, copy. Okay, yeah, they're, uh, they're going right up, so it, apparently they've, they've cleared the environment in terms of being safe to breathe and work in shirt sleeves. Open manifold three. Welcome. Now they're just reconfiguring some of the reaction control system or RCS valves for ground maintenance and checkout. Now even though the truck carrying the steps is approaching the uh, space shuttle, it'll be a few more minutes, I suspect, before they open the door. Oh, definitely. Uh, they've got to... We'll open it from the outside, even though the crew is capable of throwing the levers and opening it up uh, pretty rapidly. They generally have the, the maintenance people open it up. So it'll take them probably 15 minutes or so just to take off the pieces of tile and give them access to the mechanisms to get into it. And Challenger Houston, you are no-go for extended power-ups. Roger, stand no-go for extended power-ups. What's the place to go in? Interesting. Roger. Interestingly, when they open that hatch, because uh, I've been in the exchange room a couple of times, they open that hatch and you can just literally feel the metal behind the tile just radiating heat out. Not like an oven, but it, there's definitely a, a warmth to it. We've got to... Portable ramp driven up to the uh, side hatch of Challenger for the crew egress. We have to negotiate a tremendous amount of energy uh, coming in from, from orbit. And uh, most of it we dissipate in shocks. Here yeah, we can save the crew, I think, through the... Uh... Sure, that'd be crit. He's busy, though. So he won't wave. If he realizes he's on camera, he probably will, but uh, he's, he's <laughs> oh, kind of busy at the moment. <laughs> I don't think I'd call him a ham. I'd call him a politician or a... <laughs> <laughs> they had uh, very uh, clever uh, T-shirts that they wore at the news conference yesterday with the... Uh, letters and blazing okay, the, GTC pass, or GTC all up coming down. the ace satellite repair Roger. company that propeller you just saw was to help keep air moving over the vehicle to not for cooling but again to get fresh air in in case they do get any concentrations of uh, bad gas around sure looks to be in pretty good shape doesn't it it does I can see some discoloration along the sides. Uh, I'm used to seeing the uh, Columbia look like that, but now I can see Challenger's getting to be a, a space-worked vehicle as well. This is, uh, what number, six? Sixth flight of Challenger? Oh, I, I believe. haven't been keeping track. That sounds sixth. about right, though. And the 11th of uh, all of our shuttle flights for the country. They look like they're moonwalkers, and they have little sniffers, sniffers to right. sniff around to see if any of the chemicals that they use. Some of those chemicals they use for the thrusters in the uh, shuttle are toxic. In fact, they could be fatal if you inhale enough of them. So they sniff around to make sure they don't have any leaking thrusters. So when the door opens and the astronauts emerge, 
Um, they aren't, of course, exposed to any of that sort of thing. Chuck, I see the door is open and the, uh, the, the, the stairs are up. I wonder if our own control room is aware of the, um, the crew. The ACE satellite repair crew has not come out yet. Uh, when they do, I guess they have little wobbly legs, but boy, will they be um, happily received. I want to tell you. It was such a successful mission. A whole After a couple of days when it was oh, a little, little touch and go, and it looked like they were going to have to bring back um, a mission without Challenger flight crew at this time the preparing to uh, leave Challenger, come down the stairs to take the van back to Trident Flight Research. On time as their shuttle was. What do you want to bet? Yeah. Well, that's a live picture. And we're seeing pictures live from Edward Air Force Base of the astronauts as they've just uh, come down the steps. The other 3,300 passengers coming off the spacecraft. The bees, they're all walking very well. They, they seem to have their sea legs. From, uh, well, with the picture we'll hold, we'll identify them from left to right. Well, you see big ox. 3,300 honeybees, that is. Followed by Dick Scobie, Terry Hart, Pinky Nelson, and Bob Crippen. All of them shaking hands. Well, they did a super job. Challenger landed at Edwards Air Force Base at 8.38 uh, Eastern Time this morning. The alternate uh, landing spot since the uh, clouds and rain moved in over the Kennedy Space Center. They'll make a walk around now, won't they, of the uh, shuttle to see how it uh, fared? S sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Looks like they are going to go ahead and take a look. completing a successful seven-day mission in space where the crew uh, deposited or deployed and put into orbit the long-duration exposure facility, a passive experiment uh, lab with 57 experiments on board. They then proceeded to rendezvous, retrieve, and bring aboard Challenger, the Solar Max $77 million Sun Observatory satellite. They repaired it, replaced uh, two units on it, and then put it back into orbit and ground control reports it's functioning normally. They'll spend the next 30 days checking out that satellite. And uh, if it does function normally, it'll be good uh, up there, we understand, until the end of the decade. So the crew of Challenger are making a brief walk around of their shuttle Challenger. And we are not certain whether they'll stop and uh, have a few words in front of the microphones that they're probably out there somewhere or whether they'll go right on in. I guess they will go on into, uh, they have got a uh, well, flight exam or yeah, medical first, exam. First order of priority is go, uh, go get your post-flight physical and, and get a chance to take a shower. Crippen, and, uh, there's goes Van Hoften. And is that Hart? Dick Dick Kirby, and there's Terry Hart. Terry Hart. To the Dryden complex. Meanwhile, the uh, crew insignia, our flight patch, is being uh, hung on the uh, wall here in Mission Control. That was a pretty good time getting them out of the orbiter, too. Just about 30 minutes after mm -hmm. they've touched down at Edwards Air Force Base. And where will they go from here, Woody? They'll go back to the Dryden Flight Research Facility, and uh, there's a team of doctors there waiting to just give them a good physical and see what uh, see how their health is. I can I can almost tell them that their health is good. They all look fine. Is there anything particular that they check for after a space mission of seven days out there? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Just uh, just general health. Uh, after space lab, now they they wanted blood samples and quite a few other things. But these guys will be a pretty uh, pretty fast physical. My director Gary Coyne congratulating his team on the uh, good entry and landing. And uh, at uh, elapsed time of seven days, 11 minutes, this is Mission Control Houston signing off until Flight 41 dog on June 19th. <laughs> We're going to take a look now. The first down the stairs, followed by Dick.